One of the spiritual practices that my spouse and I have taken up since the beginning of the pandemic is to go hiking in the woods several times a week. Where we live, we are blessed with a network of park systems, from the Cuyahoga National Park to several county park systems to city parks. There are also many state natural preserves and wildlife sanctuaries that are close by with trails for us humans. We visit the closest parks quite regularly, as you might expect, and have enjoyed watching the changes over the seasons. Back in early spring, we noted the trillium, the trout lilies, and the wild ginger. We learned how to identify elm trees so that we could forage for their companion fungi, the morel mushroom. We watched the red buds and dogwoods flower and watch the buds on the trees leaf out into so many shades of green. We learned to recognize and appreciate more and more trees. We noted the trunk sizes and the mix of tree varieties and tried to guess the age of second growth forests. We visited old growth forests to note the differences. As summer turned to fall, we watched the leaves turn into reds and golds and noted the chanterelles on the forest floor and the hen of the woods on the tree trunks. As the leaves made their journey to the forest floor, we noticed the colors and textures of tree trunks and branches and tried to match the trees to leaves littering the ground. We noticed the understory of canes, shoots, and branches. We noted the red berries of the honeysuckle, the black berries of the buckthorn, and the red and yellow combination of bittersweet. We could also observe the contour of the land, including ponds and marshes that were hidden by the summer's foliage. Along with paying attention to what was happening in the woods over the summer and throughout the year, we've been paying even closer attention to our backyard garden. We have been attempting to practice permaculture, which is a way of working with nature to grow things that are useful for humans. Permaculture draws on indigenous practices, practices that are grounded in a world's view that is worlds away from our Western culture of extraction and exploitation. It's a worldview where humans are a part of nature, not apart from nature. It is a worldview of mutuality and gratitude. A couple of years ago, I had the blessing of a three month sabbatical. I took some of the time learning about permaculture. I took a two week intensive residential certificate course and my spouse and I landscaped our backyard. I also toured the Baltics for a month. I spent most of my time in Latvia where my father was born and where I still have cousins. I timed my trip so I could be there for the summer solstice and I arranged it so that my son and daughter could join me for that week. Growing up, my family had always celebrated the summer solstice with the Latvian community in western Michigan out in the country. We would gather at a farm under a grove of oak trees. The women made wreaths for us to wear on our heads, oak leaves for the men and crowns of flowers for the women and girls. As the dark descended, the men lit a fire in a basket that was attached to a pole. Once the pole was raised and secured so that the fire was burning above our heads, the singing would begin. The celebration would go on until sunrise. With this child's memory of snippets of this annual feast day, I arrived in Latvia hoping to learn more. After visiting some family in Riga, I headed for a week as a woofer on a Latvian permaculture farm near the Rus Russian border in a place called Latgalia. Woofing is a program where people can work on an organic farm in exchange for room and board. Along with some permaculture practices, the farm family that I stayed with exposed me to many folk traditions. The folk traditions are based on the Baltic version of the pagan Wheel of the Year. Each quarter, the solstices and the equinoxes 
and cross quarter, the halfway points between the quarters, has its tasks associated with planting and harvesting. The family had only been working on the farm for about a decade, so I asked them, how did you learn about all this folklore? I had collected English translations of Latvian folk tales over the years, but they shed very little light on the culture. The family said, oh, it's all in our folk songs. They proceeded to bring out a 12 volume set of books containing tens of thousands of four line folk songs known as Dinus. Everything you need to know about being Latvian is in these songs. Many of the songs reveal a soul deep connection to nature. Here is an example. Sunlight in the evening scatters gifts upon the forest treetops, golden crown upon the linden, silver crown upon the oak, leaves of diamond on the birch tree, golden rings upon the pussy willow. The Latvian's reverence for trees that is expressed in song is also expressed in how they care for trees. They will support a droopy tree limb instead of trimming it off. My son noticed how new buildings would be designed and placed so that existing trees would not be disturbed. Other songs talk about the cycles of life and the cycles of the year. Ensuring a good harvest was a matter of life and death, since the stores needed to last through a long, cold winter. The symbols on the solar candle reflect this. Yanni, or the summer solstice, coincides with the first hay harvest. Yumi is celebrated in early August by making the first loaf of bread from the new rye harvest. Its symbol is two crossed shafts of rye, the heads hanging heavy with grain. Apiumimus, the fall equinox, adds root vegetables to the shape. These harvests are an opportunity for gratitude for the bounty of nature. The next season, in the late fall starting in early November, is called Martigny. The harvest is done and everything is buttoned up for the season. The days are getting noticeably shorter. They get really short at the Latvian latitude of 57 degrees to the north. By winter solstice, there is only six hours and 45 minutes between sunrise and sunset. The symbol of Martigny has several meanings that signal resilience. It has two stylized roosters who are the messengers of light. They remind us that even as the days grow shorter, the light will return. The second meaning is that we need to huddle together like the roosters are doing because we need the light and warmth of family and friends. The third meaning shows a hardier root as compared to the fall equinox symbol. This reassures us that the life force that lies dormant is stored in the roots of the forest as well as in the harvested beets and potatoes that are stored in the root cellar. These will sustain us as we hibernate during the next quarter year through the winter solstice and towards spring. In practice, this is also a time when books are read while sitting near the hearth, books almost as numerous as the logs that are added to the fire. It is a time for the arts, for spinning, weaving, and needle arts. It's a time for cards and games. It's a time for playing music and singing and learning or creating new songs for the next season of planting and harvesting. It's a time for mending and sharpening of tools for the next season of planting and harvesting. It's a season for rest and renewal after three seasons of labor. This is an old pattern of life for peoples who live with the winter season and a pattern not unique to the peoples of Northern Europe. Indigenous people who live in what is now New England, New York, and Northern Ohio wintered together in longhouses. We know well how the European settlers displaced the Iroquois, 
who are more properly known as the Haudenosaunee, literally the people of the longhouses. In trying to learn more about these first peoples, I visited a replica of a longhouse at the Seneca Art and Culture Center at Ganadagan near Rochester, New York. In the replica, you can see how each family would have a cook fire along the axis of the longhouse. Food and fuel were stored around the sleeping platforms against the walls on either side of the fire. Here, the Haudenosaunee huddled during the winter months, living upon their stores. I share these snippets because they are a reminder of human resilience in a time of hardship. And I believe that building resilience is part of our work as a faith communities going forward. We know that in our heart of hearts, we are going to need to make big changes to face the impacts of climate change. The pandemic is just one warning signal. We can trace COVID's origin as a consequence of deforestation and habitat removal. We have multiple warning signals flashing like a vehicle's dashboard when a car is in trouble. In order to listen to our heart of hearts, we need to make time and space for reflection, for imagination, for conversation. The warmth of family and community sitting in a circle around a fire or our virtual version of a fire can serve as a crucible for creativity. The circle can serve as a circle for discernment in changing times or as a balm for the spirit in times of grief and loss. Circles are a reminder that we need one another. We need the wisdom of the elder. We need the energy of the youth and young adult. We need the curiosity of the child. We need the determination of the middle adult. We need the nurturing of the aunties and the advice of the uncles. And we especially need the fresh queer eyes of those who don't conform to any of these identities. This has implications for our congregations. We are one of the few places beyond the bonds of family where generations can come together. Our membership is weighted toward the elders, but our vitality depends on including and involving all the generations. Even though we can't safely meet around a hearth physically this winter, we can still kindle our fires and create circles that connect hearts. We can tell our stories to one another. We can listen to one another's hopes and fears. We can grieve together. And we can imagine better ways to live in community. We can imagine better ways to live with the earth. And we can move from imagination to action. Here and now, in the bleak midwinter, with snow on snow on snow, we can still give our hearts. However poor we might be in spirit or in wealth, we can still give our hearts. In spite of the frosty wind, in spite of the hard iron of the earth, in spite of the stone cold water, we can still give our hearts. Amen and blessed be.